All right, let me ask you about being a new father. Congratulations, first of all. How's that feel? Feels great. Yeah. Another baby girl in the mix. So, uh, as I said, you know, it's a big deal having having kids in general, but to have a baby girl and um, and be responsible as a father for for you know to lead a, a little girl in the right direction and be there for her throughout her life is a it's an amazing responsibility, and I'm lucky to have that now two times over. On the road a lot, though, how, is it difficult to keep those connections? Um, no, it's just all of the work you put into it. It's okay. priorities, you know, and my priority is my family and my little girls, and um, so, I, you know, I guess it's not easy by any means, but it's not hard. Cool. It's, it's, you want them to do what you do? I mean, music? Not really. I mean, I, I don't <laughs> want not want them. Yeah. To, I don't want not want them to do what yeah. I, I've done, but uh, I want them to do what they want to do. That's 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 what I would say. I would tell them to do what I did, which was do what I wanted to do. My parents were, were supportive of that when I left college, so I hope the same for my kids. I just want them to follow their heart, follow their dreams, and um, and I will be very supportive of that. I'm on TV in Houston, so people recognize me. My two daughters never wanted to tell people they were Tom Cook's daughter because they didn't want to be defined by that. How do you make sure your daughters aren't defined in life as Jake Owen's daughters? You talk to, I mean, will you talk to them about that or? Uh, yeah, I, I've already talked to that about. Um, your six. I talked with that about that with my six-year-old Pearl. Um, she's old enough to to understand that her dad sings songs and things and <laughs> she doesn't understand sometimes why everybody sh will be in a grocery store and someone will come up and want to take a photo and she'll say dad everybody always wants to take photos and I always tell her I said well that's what affords us the ability to come here to the grocery store Pearl but uh, I, it's a hard thing you know for her at this age or, and as they go through life I guess I'll have to explain to them more about how to find their own life and not just be the, the daughters of, of, of me but you know, my dad was was a successful guy. He worked hard, and um, I never lived in his shadow. I always wanted to do my own thing. I just think it's how you raise your children and, and give them any opportunity that they, that they could possibly have to blossom into what they want to be. You know, you're one of the few country stars who didn't start off thinking about this, right? Having a, had a having a dream about singing on stage. You, you wanted to be a golfer. Can you tell me that story of what happened and how it changed your life? Yeah, well, I, I, it's kind of been a misconstrued story over the years. I went to college at Florida State. Um, had a my, golf scholarship? My twin brother had a full tennis scholarship to go there. I was a pretty good golfer. I played lots of sports in high school, but I really wanted to try to, I was better at golf. Um, wanted to get a scholarship. I went up there to take a walk-on spot at uh, Florida State, and I ended up not playing. And um, at that time, after spending a lot of years and money, my parents, you know, said, "Well, you were going to go up there and try to get a scholarship, and now you're not. And if you're not going to play sport like Jared, my brother, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of downtime for you. So you better get a job because we're not just going to pay for you to sit around school and not do anything." And uh, there was a guy sitting on a bar stool playing music, and he had a pitcher of beer in front of him and a pitcher full of one dollar bills or whatever people were tipping him. And I said, "I want to do that," and, <laughs> oh. and not knowing that it would actually work out. But I always loved music and I loved playing guitar and I like writing songs um, and just never thought that I could do it as a profession until I asked the bar owner at that same bar if I could play there one night and he allowed me to do that. And it felt great to know that people liked what I was doing and I kind of turned it into a little profession around, uh, around Tallahassee and then I left college and moved here to Nashville. So thankfully my dad told me to get a job a long time ago and, and, that, and uh, that job's never changed. So the wakeboarding story wasn't quite true. Injuring the shoulder and you couldn't do it anymore? Yeah, I, I, I was hurt, so I really couldn't play at the level that, that I needed to play to, to take that scholarship at Florida State. So these kids that are playing college sports these days are unbelievable, yeah. and um, yeah. I just wasn't good enough. Yeah. So you injured the shoulder, and you, you might have been onto a Could have, would have, should have. Could have, would have, should have. You never know. <laughs> but I'm happy where I am, so I try not to even look back at that. So... Is the story true then? You come to Nashville and you go to a bank and give a, a cut of a record or? Right down the street, right? You know, not even three or four buildings down from behind my back. Um, I've always believed in, in you, the word manipulation is a little strong, but I believe in you can manifest your destiny by what you believe in the places you put yourself in. Now, I would have never been able to probably ever get a record deal if I'd have never had the wherewithal to leave Tallahassee, Florida early, which most people thought I was crazy. Like, why would you not graduate college? My dad even said, if I wanted to take a four-year vacation, I would have taken one. Um, 
but uh, he believed me when I called him and said that I had a passion and a plan to come to Nashville and try to make it as a singer. I just felt like I'd outgrown the little the town of Tallahassee. And um, I moved here uh, a couple days later after talking to him. He gave me his blessing, cool. and he just told me he'd support me uh, as a father, and but he wouldn't support me financially. <laughs> and luckily, I'd saved up enough money to come up here at least for, I thought I could get by for a few months. I met a lady a few doors behind me um, at a bank, and her name is Becky McElwain. Told her what I was doing here. She asked me if I had a CD. I just happened to have one in my pocket, and I gave it to her. And the next day, she called me and said, I loved your music, and I'd love to uh, pass this around to some people if you don't mind. And that's kind of how the ball got rolling got for rolling. me. So it was, it's kind of a Cinderella story, yeah. but uh, I do believe that if I would have never take, taken the opportunity to put myself in this situation, um, and be here in Nashville, that lady at that bank would have never happened. And if I hadn't have thought, well, if I'm gonna start a bank account, why not start one on Music Row? Because I'm sure maybe someone at the bank works with other people in the music industry, so that's probably my best place to go try to find a bank account. And so trying to think of things in that way, I think has helped align me in the path that I've taken throughout this business. Interesting. Um, Every song obviously has a story behind it. So let me just throw out some songs that you've done. I know you didn't write all of them, but tell me the uh, idea behind it or the genesis of the song or maybe just the feeling that went into including it on an album um, and sort of what inspired that. So Yeehaw, first of all. I wrote that song. It was the first song I ever put on the radio. Um, I remember it was, I was so excited when that song came out and saw it on the radio for the first time. It said on the little screen, Jake Owen, and then heard it come out of the speakers. Um, was a big deal for me. Um, I wrote that song with Casey Beathard, who's an amazing, um, prolific songwriter, Kendall Marvel, and it was just about having fun, you know? I think that's what a lot of music is, is about having fun yeah. and presenting a, a melody that people like to sing along. And, you know, I love music for the fact that it can change lives, and I also like music for the fact that it can just kind of like get you through the next three minutes. And uh, sometimes that's all it needs to be. Starting with me. Starting With Me is a song that changes lives, like change people's lives. I wrote that as well. Um, that was my second single. It was the album title of my first album, um, figuring that it was my first album that should be starting with me. But the, the tune itself was really written around the fact of uh, if I could go back and change anything in life, I'd have to start with myself first because that's where it all stems from. And uh, pretty good song. It is a great song. Don't Think I Can't Love You. Another song I wrote. Um, is uh, my dad and my mom have been married um, for 40 years. My grandparents are still living. They've been married for 70 years. So I was raised in a family that was built upon love. And uh, that song speaks about the fact that I might never be able to buy you the finer things in life, but I can love you and that's worth more than anything. Eight Second Ride. Eight Second Ride is, is, is a song that people have, I wrote that when I was in college. Um, That's a great song too. Well, thanks. Uh, lyrically, it's pretty. It's pretty just like it's not very deep, you know. It's just a, kind of a song that feels good. But I wrote it in college. My brother told me back then when I was writing all these love songs that he said, "Man, why don't you write some songs for the guys every now and then, you know?" And so he, my brother used to um, spit tobacco. Every time I'd get in his truck, he would say, "Watch out for that cup right there, man! Don't knock it over." It was where he'd spit his dip. <laughs> Nasty. Yeah. And so I wrote that song for my brother with the line in there that says, climb on up and watch the cup where I've been spitting my dip inside. Okay. So that's where that came from. That's cool. All right, um, tell me. Tell me. Uh, a song that didn't really do too well on the radio, uh, but one of my favorite songs yeah. I've written, um, it's, uh, it's tell me why I keep holding on to this, this relationship when I know that it's like staring down the barrel of a loaded gun. I mean, I know I'm, it's bound to kill me. So why am I doing this? Is really what that song is about. I've, I've had many of those relationships. Barefoot Blue Jean Night, you didn't write, right? I did but, not. That was the but, first single that I ever released that I did not write. Um, and it changed my life. So I never had a number one song until I released a song that I didn't write. So I don't know what that says, but. <laughs> yeah, because you wrote all the songs right in the first two albums. And first then... two albums I wrote everything and then um, when I had, but I think when you move to this town, look out the window here, you'll see these buildings all out here the, and this one we're sitting in, it's filled with people that are writing songs every day. Yeah. That's what they do for a living. Yeah. So because you're an artist and you wanna write your songs is, is, is great, but doesn't mean you have to write all of them. Alan Jackson, George Strait, some Brooks and Dunn, anyone in the biggest, George Jones, people, the biggest people in our format, um, 
they they didn't write some of their biggest songs. So uh, Barefoot Blue Jean Night was one of my biggest songs and I didn't write it, but people think I did because it really relates to my life and how I grew up in Florida. So, hey, I don't care if I wrote it or not. If as long as it makes people smile and have a good time and, and come out to the shows and um, I'm happy to sing a song that somebody else wrote. Cool. The one that got away. One that got away. I wrote that song about my hometown growing up in Florida. Really, never really anything going on down there. It's called Vero Beach, but we used to call it Zero Beach, obviously. <laughs> uh, I've been there. But in the, in, the, in the summertime, people come to town, and it was a song about a girl that I met um, that came to, came to town for the summer, and we had a, a nice summer together, and then she left and never saw her again. And so she was the one that got away. I like the song Ghosts. Um, That's a great song. You wrote it. I did. But you didn't, have, you didn't intend it for you. I, that's an interesting story. Because that fascinates me. You, you presented it to Kenny Chesney or someone did? Yeah. That was at the time before I had a record deal. And I wrote that song, Ghost, uh, which is a great song about um, and it, you know, putting down addiction and getting past it. And uh, Kenny Chesney heard it and put it on hold, which really gave me some validity as an artist. Um, so that even had the ball rolling for me quicker being a guy that didn't have a record deal at the time. So Kenny Chesney definitely helped, helped me get a record deal. Yeah, That fascinates me, though, that an artist like Kenny Chesney says, well, I, I love it, but it doesn't fit the album I'm doing and passes on it then. Yeah. And you could have gone to somebody else with it, right? I could have, but at that point, you know, knowing that Kenny Chesney thought it was a good enough song to possibly record, I thought, well, I probably ought to do this for myself. So I put it on my album. Okay. How do you know a song's good enough to record? That's like asking, how do you know, how do you know a woman's good enough to marry? Okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. like you just believe it in your heart. You know, you know that it's not just a woman. I mean, it's yeah. anything in life, yeah. it, it, situations you get yourself into. Yeah. The song "What We Ain't Got." Um, we all want what we ain't got. Is is uh, is is the truth of who we are. I feel as human beings, we're always longing for something that we don't have. Meanwhile, um, we're not really sometimes paying attention to what's right in front of us. And there's a line in that song that says, I wanted the world until my whole world stopped. And I think um, we've all been guilty of, of, of wanting a little more and not being appreciative of what we have in front of us. Yeah. American Country Love Song? American Country Love Song uh, was just a big smash hit song for me, a uh, big number one. Um, and it's about just this beautiful country we live in. It doesn't matter where you go. There's people doing the same things in all these different places and towns. It's just, we tend to all be from different places. But we're all, you know, here under the great red, white, and blue, and the stars and stripes. Is that your cool van on the cover? Yeah, that's my 1966 Volkswagen van. I drove it from here to Key West and made that video. You still have it, huh? Oh yeah. Still drive it? I do. Yeah, I drove it the other day. Okay. All right. Song "Good Company." Good Company is a song about just being with good people. It's kind of how I like to live my life. It's. Um, you know, I just want to be in good company. It's, and, and you are who your friends are, sort of idea. But you started the podcast based on that, or right after that? Your yeah, I started a podcast and named it Good Company. Yeah. I just felt like it really went hand in hand with the kinds of people I was talking to. I mean, talking to good people about good stories and good life and, yeah. You like the podcast? It's enjoyable doing it? I, I, I enjoy it. I, I enjoy uh, being able to connect with people yeah. out there that want, a little, that want to know more about me and what I'm into more than just music. Yeah, I enjoy the ability to connect with folks in a way where I'm not just singing to them. I'm able to speak to them and tell them about my life and things I believe in and love and learn about them as well. That, that's really what the podcast is about, is talking to people about their lives and getting great positive stories out of it. I love positivity. Yeah. Uh, I was Jack, you were Diane. Now that's also sort of a complicated thing, right? Because you had to get John Mellencamp's okay and kind of go through some hoops. Well, yeah, we, we talked about making this on my new album. We talked about having some songs um, in the vibe of Jack and Diane. Because I, I said that is a quintessential song that to me exemplifies the heartland of America and how we all grow up as kids. And those kind of songs are the kinds of songs that made me want to play music. So I wanted to have that type of song on my album. And when I said that, the smart songwriters that are here in this building thought, why don't we do a remake of that song using the melody, but write an ode to John Mellencamp saying, you know, I'll never forget when we were those kids, when yeah. I was Jack yeah. and you were Diane. And um, so that was kind of how that came about. But Mellencamp said, he's like, that's a great idea. And he gave us a thumbs up on it. So. And it's a great video. It's just Thank a great you. video. Thank you. You've, you've done a lot of great videos. You enjoy doing that? 
I love, you know? I love doing videos. Um, I love everything about what I do for a living. I really do. I'd tell you if I would. If, if I didn't, I would not be sitting here right now. Um, there's lots of other things that I could be doing. Yeah. Um, but I generally love the entertainment aspect. I love meeting people. I love changing people's lives. Today, I got a, a message, um, direct message on my Instagram from a guy that's in Denver, Colorado, putting on, um, he does a charity for uh, underprivileged children and um, asked, he's like, I hate to reach out to you about this, but would you be would you be interested in donating some time? And I said, absolutely. Because first off, the fact that the guy just on a whim sent me a message on Instagram thinking I would even read it. Uh, That's cool. It's cool. And so I did read it. And, I, and, and, and the fact that he's reaching out for a charity, he has nothing, he's not benefiting from it, but these children are. Like that's really what we're, what I believe, where I've come in my life, in my path, in my career, is what's helping me like just love what I do. Okay. Um, what was your first big splurge after you signed your first record contract? Do you remember? Was there something you went, I'm just going to go buy this? I mean, maybe a, a truck okay. or something, a car. I've never really been frivolous when it comes to um, like being ostentatious or anything. I mean, I have a nice house and I have a nice uh, a nice ride and and I and I got I have everything I need in life really, man. I, yeah. I never really went out there. I'm not like flashy. I don't really wear jewelry or anything. I yeah. just you know how to play songs. But in this business, people don't grow up knowing the business aspect of it. And when you become a star, right? Yeah, you, you hire. You got, for lack of a better word, it's an a very entourage. good. It's a very good question. Um, I was going to school at Florida State to be a um, uh, economics major and um, in political science, along with English. It was kind of weird. I, I couldn't pick one, but none of them really intrigued me. So when I dropped out of college and became this musician, I never realized that one day I would go from not having a basic uh, degree in business or management to literally employing lots of people more than 20 more than yeah. 30 you know and having to run a business as a CEO with not a business degree so I've learned th by surrounding myself with good people and and um, and getting good advice and counsel from people but uh, I think I've always been strong-headed enough to have a good business sense about me what part of the business don't you like that what part of the music business <laughs> What part of the music business don't, don't I like? Don't the like. business part. <laughs> yeah. The mu I like the music. I don't like music business. Right. But in order to be successful in anything, there's always going to be a business aspect to it. You have yeah. to, you have to, uh, you know, act professionally and, and hold yourself accountable for things. And um, I would say that what I don't like about the business is, um, is it's hard for me to distinguish between, in, in music, it's a very personal thing. Uh, you're creative together with other people. And when you have to kind of separate the creative and business, it, it, there's a rub there. So I live with I live with the guys on the road that are in, uh, that we travel right. the road together. Right. They see me more than they see their own kids and their yeah. wives. So when sometimes I need to crack down on them about something that I, that I need that any CEO would do, um, sometimes it's hard when you're out there. Like as most CEOs, they go home at night and they're not spending the night on a tour bus with the people with that the they employees. that they work with. Um, so. Those are things that you kind of get used to, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. I mean, I still, after 12 years, 13 years of having a record deal and being on the road, I'm still learning every day. Well, you're a pretty confident guy, but knowing where you are today, what advice would you have given your younger self back then, knowing what you know today? Oh, lots. I would. I mean, think. I mean, I, I do feel confident, but I, I'm sometimes confidence is a sign of. Um, of also being um, possibly uh, insecure, you know. I think not a lot of people would would admit their insecurities, but I think any one of us, when you get thrown in a world of things you don't know, some there's insecurities that, that will that will come about. But I think uh, the advice I would give to myself is in those moments of in, of insecurities, when you throw yourself in the mix of something that you know that you don't know. Like for instance, coming here, I didn't know what this would entail ten years later. But I had to tell. I could go back and tell myself now. Don't be so insecure about that because you'll figure it out. Like there was moments where I think my insecurity got to me to where I in turn ended up acting overly confident, okay. you know, and, and and it came off as arrogance. Yeah. And my arrogance was really just a stem of insecurity. Right. So that's what I would say. Just take it easy, take a deep breath, 
and know that like you'll figure it out as anyone would as long as you just keep your eyes and ears open to what people are saying. And is that the advice you'd give for those kids who are now driving into Nashville to be the next country stars? Yeah, I would tell them to just uh, take their time. Nothing, ha nothing has to happen overnight. I mean, even though it seems like mine, my life did, it didn't. You know, it was a strategic alignment of people, positions, places, right. and there was lots of up and downs. Right. Um, do you have a favorite fan story? Something you remember over the years that sticks out? You got a lot of rabid fans, I know. I mean, I, I'm so thankful for each and every one of them. They're all so different. Um, I have some fans that come out. I see them every week and I think it's amazing. And then there's fans that come out once a year, and to me, the guys that come once a year are just as important to me that come every week. Okay. And so I'm very thankful. They all have different reasons as to why they come to shows. Um, but I, I mean, just to see a familiar face and know that that person came back again means that what I'm doing is um, it's validated. Yeah. And you see those from, when we were interviewing Little Big Town years ago, before they were big stars, they said, you know, or after they became big stars, I should say, they said back then they saw those 12 people that came to every show. They loved them, and they were the. And then years on later, you they're, know, they're still there. They're still there. That's what it's about. As long as you take care of people and give them what they want, which isn't really hard. They want a good time. They want good music. They want you to just acknowledge that they're there and show them that you appreciate them. And w what we get in return is unbelievable. I mean, it's tenfold that. I mean, we're. Uh, just to walk out, there's nights. I saw Kelsey Ballerini post a uh, Instagram the other day saying that she felt insecure walking on stage that night. She didn't feel good. She didn't even know if the crowd liked her. But it wasn't until, you know, 10 minutes into her show that the crowd completely changed her mind and made her realize, like, holy, what? Why was I even thinking that? Like, I'm yeah. lucky to do this. Yeah. That's how I feel every day. Cool, cool. Let me go back to your brother for a second. I, I read his quote or your quote that you often help him out with the girls. <laughs> I don't no, I mean I don't help him out with the girls. He's Jared, I have a twin brother, so he's yeah. fine on his own. He's he's done just fine. Yeah. Did he often get compared to you though? Or did you get compared to him because your parents said, "Well, look at he's got the college degree and going on." Was there a rivalry there? Oh, well, yeah, we still have a rivalry. Okay. I mean, we work together and we have a rivalry. But um Yeah, I mean, Jared was always the stud growing up. He still is a stud. But um he had, you know, he was a great athlete in, in uh, junior tennis and baseball and football, and the, he was like one of the greatest players on our high school basketball team. Okay. We went off to college. He was an All-American, graduated with financial degree, wow. and I dropped out. Yeah. So I was always the not so, you know, <laughs> I don't yeah. know that my parents, they say they were, but like, I'm not sure. There, there were moments where like, you know, when someone's like, so how's Jake doing these days? And I'm sure they're like, <laughs> uh, well, you know, he's... Moved off to Nashville <laughs> trying to make it big, you know, we don't really know other than that. So the tables have changed a little bit, you know, I mean, now yeah. I work with my brother um, and he helps me support my life out here on the road, but that's, that's life. You can't yeah. ever, I feel like yeah. you can't make plans for yeah. it. So. Yeah. Okay. Restoration hardware, pretty good pickup place. I understand. Yeah. It's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I went in for a couch and ended up, ended up with a, uh, a best friend and a, and a mother to my child and. Um, yeah, Eric is amazing. That's pretty cool, though. You never know where your life's going to take a turn. I definitely didn't. I didn't go there that day thinking that it was that buying a couch was going to turn into, you know, the rest of my life um, with someone that that I love and have it and have a baby girl. So this is it's been amazing. Cool. Let me ask you about the tattoo, the feather. I know it's an ode to your heritage. Uh, that's a long story. Is it? It's not enough time today to okay. talk about that. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. What, what's your favorite song? Or do you sing your songs in the shower or do you sing somebody else's songs? Shoot. I don't know, man. I sing all kinds of music in the shower. <laughs> yeah, it's sometimes mine, okay. sometimes other people. Okay. You still have the dog named Axel? I do. You do. I have Axel, I have Slash, and I have Merle. But wasn't Axel one of the, one of the social media stars? Uh, Did well, you, Merle is. Merle's oh, Merle. my bulldog. Okay. And Axel is my German Shepherd. Okay. And he, uh, since Merle doesn't really move around too much, Axel seemed pretty lonely running in the farm, so he needed a buddy. So I got him Slash. Because you can't have Axel without Slash. <laughs> no, you can't. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You love doing the social media, though, because you've become like this Instagram. 
Uh, I mean, I used to. I've really kind of got away from it, and I'm mad at myself for that, but I just got fed up with it. I, I, I mean, I love doing it because I liked providing people with things that they could see in my life that they didn't know. And I like being funny. I like, I like making people laugh, you know. I'm not into like, hey, I just ate a salad. Here's a picture I of it. I, um, I just went to Starbucks. I, it, yeah, yeah, but that's the way the world is. I mean, people... People like social media, so I, I need to, instead of getting annoyed with it, I need to just be get back with it. But I also, I've noticed that sometimes it totally cuts into my personal life, and there's days where I'm sharing personal things about my personal life, and I should just be utilizing my life it, the way it should be with, like, put the phone down and be with my family and friends. Yeah. yeah. It's not well, always about l leveraging my career. Yeah. And I feel like sometimes that's what we've all been uh, guilty of doing is let's see what we can do today to let people know so that so people don't forget about us you know what i mean I, like i'm okay with people forgetting about me for a few days i'll i'll, I'll, They'll I'll come be back. back later yeah exactly can i ask you to tell the phil mickelson story uh i mean i, I don't really think there's like a need to really i mean i've already told it you know what i mean like it's everywhere it's like, I, I just at this I point know. it's just like redundant Okay. If you don't mind, you know no, what no, I mean? No, 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 like, no. I, I just, I find Everybody's it asked me that since, yeah, since every, then, and yeah. I just feel like th that was such, that was enough the way it was that I just, I don't know that it adds anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what do people not know about you now since they seem to know most of your life? You're on social media. What would somebody be surprised to know about Jake Owen? Wow. What would people be surprised to know about me? Um... Honestly, there's not a whole lot of people I think would be surprised to know about me. I've been overly transparent, I think, throughout my career, which I think has really been a ben benefit to me um, in a enabling me to grow. I think in music sometimes people want to know more about the artist than just the music. And my life and the way I, that I've lived has really translated into my music. So I think it really connects both worlds and allows people to see more of me and understand me more. And when, in, when someone that's a fan of you and your art that you're making knows about you, they, just, they tend to buy into you more, I believe. And, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. Okay. Um, I love the name of your life's tour, Life is What You Make It. Is that, we talked before about how you can be a figure of your destiny. Do you, is that what you, is that your philosophy in life, or at least part of it? Life is what you make it. I think so. It's like I told you earlier. I mean, I think you can, you manifest your destiny, and, and life is what you make it. You know, you can wake up in the morning and and be in a bad mood and carry that mood with you through the rest of the day, and it's going to be contagious to other people. It's just not going to be a good day. If you walk in rooms and you say hey to people and you smile and you make sure you know that, like you're going to change people's personas, and I, I like that. I think one by one is is maybe hippie or heady as it sounds. I believe we all have the ability to change our every day and everyone else's day. Yeah, I agree with you, I agree with you. So what can people expect from the Houston show? I know you played in Houston before. This is a really big deal, obviously for us, but for the city of Houston. Yeah, it's a huge deal. First off, it's a huge deal that it's July 4th, you know? I mean, the celebration of our independence, um, to be singing songs together, you know, um, in a free country, because thanks to the men and women that, that give us that opportunity, freedom isn't free. We all know that. Um, so I'm super excited. I, and, and anytime I have the opportunity to play for people, especially on a massive holiday like that, um, I'm going to give it all I've got. I'm going to make sure they ha they smile, they have fun. They're bringing their kids out, their families. They could be going anywhere and doing anything on this day. And and the fact that they're going to be with us there that day and we're going to be there with them, let's make the most of it. It's going to be great. Cool. Do you have uh, childhood memories of the 4th of July? Were there Absolutely. Some yeah, so I, growing up for me um, in Vero Beach, Florida, it was the home of Dodger Town. So we had the we had the uh, the Dodgers come through for spring training. So I used to always go over to Dodger Town and watch the fireworks. We have two beautiful bridges in our hometown that cross the intercoastal waterway. So we'd all walk the bridges and stand up there and watch the fireworks. But it's just a time that you can remember being with your family. I I mean that feeling of riding on your dad's shoulders and like getting a little closer to the fireworks because dad put you up there. Like. I'm able to do that now for my kids, and I look back and think about how my dad did that for me. Like, Fourth of July is something they always remember. It's a pretty American thing. It's about as American as it gets. It is a pretty, it is a great thing. I, I remember those days, too. Is, what would be, like, the ultimate gig you could play, and with who? Would there be one? I asked that of somebody else. Uh, I think it was uh, John Rich of Big and Rich, and he said, I'd play Wembley Stadium with Frank Sinatra. Oh, wow, well, that sounds, that sounds <laughs> like John Rich. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, yeah. Uh, John, that would be cool. Uh, 
You know what? For me, I really mean this. But to me, like the end all be all of uh, would be just to like continue to do what I do. It's not that I don't have goals, but if someone asked me, when do you feel like you made it? And I promise you, it's what I said to you earlier. Like the day that I got to play in Tallahassee on a bar stool in front of 50 people and they gave me free beer, like I felt like I made it then. So this has just been bonus. All these years later, it's just been a big bonus. And every day I wake up going, am I still able to do this? Yeah. So as long as this keeps going the way it's going and I work hard, I'm happy with where we're at. I'm not gonna wish for anything more. And this is a tough business to stay on top though, isn't it? I mean, because you got those kids driving in every day. Every day. I mean, it's just like the NBA. It's just like the Major League Baseball. I mean, it's like there's professionals every day trying to trying to get a spot on that team. And in here in town, there's people that want to take someone's spot off the radio because there's somebody right behind you. So I'm really, um, I'm really proud. And I'm not just proud of myself. I'm proud of my band. I'm proud of my my team. We've all been in this together for a long time, and it, and it's not just because we've just half-assed it. I don't know if I could say that, but. Sure. It's because we've really, we've really worked hard and we're proud of, of not only what we've done and where we are, but we're proud and excited for where we're going. Okay. Hey, that was a cool show, I'm Coming Home, the ABC show. Yeah. Do you like doing that? That was cool. That was cool. Yeah, they did a good job with that. They did a great job. Do you ever think about acting? I did. I just finished a movie. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, oh. It's a big deal, man. I, um, I just finished a movie called The Friend um, starring Casey Affleck, Dakota Johnson. Okay. Um, uh, Jason Siegel. Uh, it was filmed in Fairhope, Alabama. It's a true story about a husband and a wife, um, Matthew and Nicole Teague. The story was originally in Esquire magazine that, that Matthew, he's a uh, j journalist, wrote about his wife. She was diagnosed with terminal cancer and, um, and it was tough on him, obviously, and their children. And their best friend from college, this guy named Dane, um, left everything, his job and his place um, in New Orleans and moved to Fairhope, Alabama to live with them and take care of them. And the story is a beautiful story about how friends can be there for you in the hardest times and, and what a friend means. And um, so I was really proud to be a part of that. And, and heck yeah, I'd love to be a part of another movie as well. I mean, what was your role in that? Um, I was a friend of the friend. Okay. So yeah, it was, okay. it was a big, it was a big deal. It was a really big movie and I can't believe I, they asked me to be a part of it, but uh, if they asked me again to do it, do it, I'd do it again. Well, music videos, that's kind of acting too, isn't it? Somewhat, but I mean, there's days, I tell people all the time, walking out on stage and playing, playing music, sometimes every night's acting, yeah. you know, because yeah. there's nights where I'm not feeling well, but I can't let those people in the crowd know that. I mean, they need, they yeah. need to, they're there for, to have a good time. So I gotta do the job that I signed up for. Yeah. So. Your yeah. family's got to be really proud of you now, now though. The way you, your, your dad doesn't have to ask, does he still have that apartment rent paid? Yeah, well, my dad never paid my, he never <laughs> I paid know. my apartment rent. Like he, I think that's why I learned a long time ago that I had to work hard, is because my dad would always support me as a father, but he would always also let me know that it's your responsibility as a grown man to take care of yourself and your life. And um, I don't think if he would have given me that, that sort of stern outlook on life that I wouldn't be where I am right now, taking care of my life and taking care of my family on my own. It's, I'm proud of that. That's a yeah. big deal as a, as a man to feel that way. It is. It is. It is. All right. Uh, that's all questions I have, unless there's something else you want to talk about. Quick question. What was the conversation like with your parents when you got that first record on the radio, song on the radio, or that first contract? What was that conversation like from time to time? Um, yeah, hearing my song on the radio for the first time was validation, you know, that I could tell my parents, like, this is happening. This has happened. But there's no guarantee ever mm -hmm. either. So mm -hmm. I think it took me six to seven years of fi to finally feel like, okay, I'm a, I'm a legitimate part of this business and um, I can hang my hat on this. I'm not just a, a one hit wonder. You know, I've, I've, um, I think I've put out close to 20 singles on the radio, had um, seven number one songs. Um, I've toured with some of the greatest artists that you can imagine and, and still learning every day. But uh, I think my parents are finally, I think they're pretty happy and proud of me. Yeah. And I think they're more proud of me as a human being and a father, being a good dad and being a chari charitable person, um, philanthropist. Um, that's what they're really proud of. The music thing, I think they're like, yeah, that's cool and all, but right. it's about the person you are that matters. It is, it is. Do you remember, and I know, I'm sure you do. Where were you the first time you heard the first song on the radio? Right here in Nashville, I was driving down Broadway. I came on, Yeehaw by Jake Owen. I had to pull over and take a photo of it. It's pretty neat. 
Just so you didn't crash into somebody else, huh? Yeah. <laughs> like, that's yeah. my song. Yeah. That's, that's got to be a good tune. I mean, as a kid, when did you feel that, hey, I mean, at some point in time, you have to, you know, start. When did you start feeling and, and actually writing songs? Yeah, I started writing songs when I was in college. Um, I think I wrote songs as a kid, too. Uh, I, I would make stories up. That's why I wanted to be um, a political science English major. Yeah. I loved writing. I loved creative journalism. I just always liked writing, so... I think um, I've always been creative. I got that from my mom. My mom was the more creative. My dad was the more business-minded, stern guy. So I got best of both worlds. That's sometimes <laughs> sometimes not so great, you know. Sometimes it clashes, yeah. Yeah, I wrote a song, too. We had a band we started when we were 10 years old, and not one of us knew how to play an instrument, so it didn't quite work out. But Oh, wow. <laughs> hey, man, but you were ambitious at 10. So. At 10, yeah. <laughs> but That's my cool. mom had to go rent us, like, guitars and drums and... And she said, but none of you play any instruments. <laughs> hey, but your mom supported you. My mom did support us. Thanks, man. I'm telling nice you, to you, nice to meet you. Talk about a yeah. bad garage well, band. Hey, pleasure. Much, Good to see yeah. you. We'll see you on the 4th of July. Thanks right, for your yeah. time. Yeah. Super nice to meet you as you well, too. man. Yeah. Appreciate you all coming out here to do this. Great Great you, so you guys uh, leaving tomorrow? or oh, We're leaving Saturday. Saturday. Kelly Pickler's you know, with you on stage, and uh, she's doing an interview Saturday morning. So oh, all right. Okay. We do an hour special the week before. So you know, that's why we always.